Hallelujah. Good, good, good day, everyone. It's time for the word of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for revelation knowledge to dawn upon our hearts. Let words and thoughts from heaven flow freely through me to your people. Let these words and thoughts continue to speak to us beyond this moment. And let signs and wonders be done in our lives in confirmation of your word. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. We've been talking about faith. Faith. Hallelujah. We Last week we looked at why faith. Why faith is important. We talked about the fact that the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. The just will manifest life by faith. So if you are righteous, if you are a believer, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, the only way to live, the only way to manifest this life is by faith. And what is this life? Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So faith is very important because it is what negates the stealing, killing, and destruction of the devil. When a person operates and manifests the life of God, stealing, killing, and destruction is hindered. All right, is hindered. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it abundantly. All right, have it to the full until it overflows. The amplified version says. So that life is the opposite of the stealing, killing, and destruction of the devil. And that life is manifested. The just shall live, just shall manifest life, this life, by faith. And we find it written four times in the scriptures. And uh, 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 we looked at several other scriptures. Uh, James chapter 1 verse 5 to 7. The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and upbraided not. It shall be given him. It will be given him. He said, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea. Then he, now, he ends by saying, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Even though it shall be given him freely, receiving is hinged on faith. You've got to believe. You've got to use your faith. It's not by crying, not by begging, not by pleading, not by talking to God like he's a, a woman and you're a guy and you're trying to move his emotions. God is not... In, God does not need to be moved emotionally to be a blessing to you. God does not need to be moved emotionally to heal you. God does not need to be moved emotionally to bless you financially. God has been moved already and not by your emotions or gimmicks or pleading or you know, uh, uh, crying. He has been moved by his love for you. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have this life. God has already been moved for you to have this eternal life, this life that, that negates the stealing, killing, and destruction of the devil. This same life that Jesus spoke about and said, you know, in John chapter 5 and verse 26, as the Father had life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life. Then in John 10, 10, he says, I am come that you might have this life and have it abundantly. That life is why Jesus came. That life is what this whole thing is about. And faith is how you live that life. All right. So we looked at all that and um, a few more verses of scripture. You find in Luke chapter 5 verse 17, the power of God was present to heal. The Pharisees were there, the Sadducees were there, but they didn't get healed. But a, a, a couple of friends who came with their, their friend, a, a couple of uh, people who came with their friend who was lame, brought that person into the midst where Jesus was and where the power of the Lord was present to heal and those ones got healed. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, so faith allowed them to get healed. The woman with the issue of blood, Jesus said, who touched me? And there were many people throng in him, several of them sick, but one woman had said in herself that if I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. She was the one that came with faith. And she got healed. So I don't have to spend a lot of time, you know, re reiterating the points we've made already. The fact remains that the just will live by faith. And so that makes faith 
prominent. It means that the just will not be able to manifest this life without faith. All right, so we need to understand faith. Faith is one of those those uh, things that pertain to the kingdom of God that you need to know how it operates. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 52, he said, which any scribe that is instructed in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, is like a householder who brings forth things new and old at will. You know, he brings forth what he wants because he's instructed in how the kingdom of God works. So let's let's dig into faith today. I said that there are four things. Let me call it three things that you need to know about faith in order to effectively use your faith. And you need to start learning to use your faith the way a hammer, a carpenter will use a hammer. I'm telling you, uh, uh, faith is to the believer what the hammer is to the carpenter. Tell a carpenter to build something for you, he will he can do it, but he needs his hammer. Uh, um, and we need to learn how to use it the way Kanta uses hammer, you know, and not hurt ourselves and not and not be blaming the wood. All right, okay. There are three things particularly. One is what faith is. The second is how to get it, and the third is how to use your faith. Think about anything really in this life. Um, success in anything really revolves around those three things. Successful. Uh, successful education will be knowing what it is, what it is you need to learn. Do you want to learn medicine? Knowing where to get it from and how to use it. If you get those three things, you're ready to go. Doesn't mean you're a doctor yet, but if you know the, 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 the what what being a doctor is, if you know how to get the information to make you a doctor, and you know how to execute and do doctoring, you're good. You're good to go. So you go to school and you learn and learn and learn and you want to come out and be able to know exactly the what, the how, and all of that so that you can be a, a good doctor. Pick and make it money. If you know how to get it and you know how to spend it wisely and you know what it is, you, you have it made. Well, that's the same thing about faith. All right. So what is faith? Let's start with that question. What is faith? Let's answer that first one. Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. The Bible says, Hebrews 11 and verse 1. The Bible says, one, minute, one moment. All right. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance. I mean, this is one of those times where you actually have an actual description of what faith is. The Bible describes faith and says it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, in other words, faith... Faith is, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to, um, I'm going to take the different translations so that the Bible itself will speak to you. I was going to explain what faith is. But then that's exactly what is being explained here, all right? So let's just look at different translations of it, and you will come up with the explanation yourself. What is faith? The New Living Translation says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Let me give you another one. The Amplified Version says, Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed, title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality think about this faith is the title deed so of things we hope for so when you when you are when faith is in operation 
You are no longer just hoping for it. Now, if you hope for a piece of land, title deed usually applies to things like land. Um, so you have a title deed is like in Nigeria, you say C of O. Um, there are different uh, title deeds, different uh, 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 documents that show ownership of a piece of land. And so if you were hoping for a land and then someone gave you the title deed to that land, transfers the title deed, sign it off to you. And now you now have a title deed to that land in your name. You're no longer hoping for the land. Can you? Are you getting that? You're no longer hoping for the land. You, you may not have gone to see the land. That's why the Bible used the word title deed. That's why I like the way Amplified said title deed. Because you may not have seen the land yet. You may not have touched the land. You may not have stood on that land. But as long as there is a title deed to that land that has been handed over to you and signed over to you, you now own the land even though you have not experienced the land. That's what faith is. So you can no longer say, I don't have a land. If you say, I don't have a land, you just lied. If somebody says, all the people that have lands in this city, stand up and you sit down, you just lied. Whether or not you have experienced the land because you have the title deed. Many years ago, someone walked up to me, one of my dearest uh, 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 daughters in the Lord and a great woman of God. One of them said, God told me to give you a, a piece of land. And then she, she gave me the title deed. I went to see the land much later. But that night, my wife and I celebrated. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We have this land. If you had told, asked me the next morning, do you have land? I would say, yes, we are landowners. Have I gone to see the land? No. Have I experienced the land? No. Can I describe the land? No. But now we were landowners. Hallelujah. All right. That's exactly how it is. So when a person is in faith about healing, has he experienced the healing? Maybe not. Has he, can he feel the healing? Maybe not. But he has a title deed. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. It means the healing is his. He is convinced of its reality. See, look at that phrase again. Conviction, the conviction of their reality. Let's, let's look at other translations. Let's look at the Derby, Derby, Derby translation. Derby translation. Now, faith is the substantiating of things hoped for. So, bringing substance to what is hoped for. So, if you have the substance of what is hoped for, you can't be hoping for it again. The conviction of things not seen. Conviction. That word conviction, I want it to stay inside of you because we are going to come back to it again and again and again. Conviction of things not seen. Let me read the New American Standard Bible. It says, New American Standard Bible. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. All right. So we can, we can, we can stop there. We keep hearing that same word. Assurance, conviction. Assurance, conviction. So what is faith? Faith is being convinced of something you are not yet seeing, something you, are, something you hope for, you have hoped for, but now you are convinced about it. That conviction is faith. So when you begin to define faith in terms of what the Bible says as conviction, then all of a sudden it becomes very easy. You can ask yourself, am I convinced about what I say I'm believing? Because people come to me and they say, Pastor Noel, you know, you, tell, you told me to give, it shall be given back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. I've been giving and giving and giving and it has not been given back to me. And I say, well, you have to give in faith. Are you believing for a return on your giving? And then they're like, yes, I've been believing. And then I ask them, if someone were to, are you convinced really that your return was coming? Were you convinced about it? See, when you say faith, people can claim faith. But everybody knows whether they are convinced or not. I said, are you convinced about it? And they're like, yeah, I think so. I'm like, if somebody had put a gun to your head when you gave that seed, somebody had put a gun to your head and said, watch this, if you 
are to get this return on your giving, we will double it again for you. But if you don't get it, we will shoot you. I said, would you go for that deal? Uh, now you begin to see. Now I'm challenging their conviction. I'm getting them to think about how much they are convinced. And they said, no. I said, can I tell you something you, can, you are very convinced about? Most of you are very convinced about your gender. I'm convinced that I'm a man. So if somebody gave me that offer about my gender, I would take it. If somebody said, you know what? If we can go check you out, check out your, your body, check out your, 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 your body, both external and internal, do tests, find out your chromosomes, and whether you are XY or just XX or, you know, whatever. Uh, 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 if, if, if we can go check all that and you turn out to be a man, we will give you $4 billion. But if we check, out, check it out and find out that you are a lady, we will shoot you. Boy, I'm taking that deal. I know that 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 I'm a man. So I'm going to take that deal. <laughs> because I'm convinced. You see, that conviction, that conviction is faith. It's faith. So you, you, you need to start now. You need to think about that idea of conviction. How convinced are you? That's what faith is. And that's what Jesus said when he said, have faith in God. Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. 22, have faith in God. Whosoever will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that what he says will come to pass. He will have whatever he says. Shall not doubt. Be convinced. The same way if I wake up one morning and my stomach is swollen, I'm not going to begin to wonder if I'm a lady, wonder if I'm pregnant. I'm not going to wonder if I'm pregnant. I can't be pregnant. I don't have the apparatus for pregnancy. I'm not equipped for pregnancy. I'm a man. So I'm not going to think and wonder if I'm pregnant. If they did a scan and they saw a baby in my tummy, I'm going to start speaking in tongues. There's a demon involved somewhere. It's not possible. All right? See, see, see how my voice is elevated. I just the imagination of someone thinking I'm a lady. That's how conv convinced I am. That's conviction. Are you like that about that healing? Are you like that about your finances? Are you like that about that amount you're believing for this month? Are you like that about the job? So think about everything you said, I'm believing God for. I'm believing. We, we use that phrase a lot. I'm believing God for a house. I'm believing God for a car. I'm believing God for, I'm believing God for, I'm believing God for. Are you convinced about it? Are you that convinced? Now, most of you will definitely say no. And some of you will even wonder if it's possible to be that convinced about anything that you cannot see. You see, because all the things I've described so far are things that I can see. I can see that I'm a man. But some of you wonder if it's possible to be that convinced about what you cannot see. The Bible says it is possible. And that's usually what separates the boys from the men, right? That's what really separates those who spend time in the world and those who don't. So like I said, we're going to talk about how to get that, to that point of conviction. Because it's not by, by your effort. Faith is the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible describes the fruit of the Spirit. And it says love, joy, peace, patience. And it mentions faith. Faith is a fruit of the spirit. Faith is a, a, a something your, your spirit naturally produces. That conviction is something your spirit produces that you don't have to struggle with. So as I talk about that level of conviction, as I've raised the bar about what faith really is, that it is conviction, you might be tempted to say to yourself, well, I really can't ever get to that point about something I do not see. Yes, you can. As long as you are a believer, your spirit has the capacity to produce that level of faith. Your spirit has the capacity to produce such conviction. And some of you have even supernaturally experienced such levels of conviction, even though it didn't come from the word. It was a gift of faith. When we study the gifts of the spirit, you will find out that sometimes God can impart faith as a gift, all right? Some of you have had been convinced about something that made no sense, and it turned out to be true, you know? Somebody offered you a deal, the deal was so perfect, 
But deep inside of you, you knew it was wrong. You knew it was, it was a lie. And it turned out to be a lie. You were convinced. You said, I'm, I'm not going for it. It turned out to be a lie. Some of you have, have had some convictions. You know? You see, those are, those are small indica indications that your spirit has capacity to produce such conviction. That it doesn't have to take a lot of strength. Just like any fruit. If you go to a mango tree and the, the, the tree is sweating, sweating, you can see sweat pouring out of the tree. Like, what's going on here? Say, I'm trying to produce mango fruit. You'll be like, something is wrong with you. The tree never struggles to produce mango fruit. Faith is a fruit of your spirit. And if you, if you do what the tree does, what does the tree do? The tree is planted by the rivers of water. The tree is planted in the soil. The tree just simply draws nutrients from the soil as easily as any other thing. Just draws nutrients from the soil and fruits pop up. Well, so as we look at how faith comes, it's as easy as that. You just simply get into the word of God and stay there and listen and listen and listen. And I'm telling you, faith will come. In fact, you can't, you, the same way you can't eat and eat and eat and not be full, the same way you cannot hear and hear and hear the word of God and not be full of faith. So the question really is how, how, how much you give yourself, how much time you lend to the hearing of the word. But before we go into how faith comes, let's, let's, let's tie up this what faith is. And I want to tie it up by sharing with you what faith is not. I found in my teaching on faith that it's always best to talk about what faith is not. Because when I talk about what faith is, people oftentimes mistake it for several other things. So let me mention three things that faith is not. And as, I, as, you, as you hear these three things, I want you to think about them, think about them deeply. One, faith is not hope. And I know that most people think they are the same thing. Faith is not hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But faith is not hope. Hope says God will do it. Faith says I have the title deed. God has done it. Hope says this person will give me his land or her land. Faith says here's the title deed. She has given me the land. Faith speaks in the past tense. There was an event. And after that event, I now have this. And oftentimes that event is what we call the point of contact. There was an event, the point of contact. It may be hands were laid on me. It may be I prayed. For the woman with the issue of blood, her point of contact is if I touch the hem of his garment. So the moment she touched the hem of the garment, that event, there was a post that event and a pre that event. Pre that event, she was saying, if I touch them of his garment, I shall be healed. That's still faith. It's still faith. And then the moment she touched the hem of his garment, after that, she went from, I shall be healed, to I am healed. Can you see that? All right. So, the same way with the title deed and the land, Oh, someone is going to give me, this lady, that woman, that guy, that man, that is going to give me a piece of land. That's hope. But then, the, an event happened. We met, and they handed the title deed. Post that event, after that event, I no longer say, I am going to ha have a piece of land, or I'm going to be given a piece of land. I say, I have a piece of land. Faith. Faith. Faith is not hope. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. First Corinthians 13 and verse 13. The Bible says, And now abide faith, hope, and love. Now abide three separate things. Faith, Hope and love. Faith is no more hope than it is love. Any more than it is love. And most people confuse faith and hope. You pray for someone and then he says, Pastor, I believe God is going to do it. I just know 
Forget it. <laughs> Your faith is not going to bring this one to pass. You know God is going to do it. Look at what Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three. Whatsoever, 24 rather, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it. Not believe you will receive it. Not believe it will happen. Believe that at that moment, there's a transaction. But the title that is being given to you, believe that you, are, that you take the title, that you receive the title deed and you shall have it. You shall experience it. You shall enter that land. You shall walk on that land. But right now, as you pray, believe that you take the title deed. That word receive, believe that you receive it. That word receive is lambano. It means believe that you take the title deed. Believe that you take it. So at the moment, use the present tense to indicate that at that moment, there is a taking happening. So you never go into prayer and come out of prayer without believing that a taking has happened. You need to start making your praying moment the event of faith, the point of faith. That pre that prayer, it was a hope. But post that prayer, it is faith. Pre the prayer, God, as I pray, will do this. But post the prayer, you walk away with, it is done. The, the prayer moment is the transaction moment. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you take it and you shall have it. But believe you take it now. All right. I'm, I'm going to make that statement again. Begin to make your prayers the faith event, the point of contact. Faith always requires a point of contact. Jesus took mud, spat on the ground, made mud, put in someone's eyes who was blind, and said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. As that person is going, he's saying to himself, When I go wash in the pool of Siloam, I shall come back seeing. But the moment he washes in the pool of Siloam, it's no longer about I shall. He must believe that sight has been transacted. There's been a transaction, a delivery of sight to him. And he lifts his hand and says, Thank you, Father, for this healing. Oh, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to Jesus. So faith is not hope any more than it is love. What are that, What else? It, let, me, let me dwell on this a little bit, forgive me. Because this is where a lot of the challenges lie for believers. For a lot of believers. Whenever you, you put faith in the future tense, you have you have downgraded it to hope. You have lowered it to hope. You have made it an expectation. Uh, let me say it this way. You have made it a wish, a desire, rather than faith. So always remember this. Hope says it will happen. Faith says it has happened. Hope says until I see it, I'm going to keep saying it will happen. Faith says, now hope is not bad. Hope is good. Without hope, you're going to be in despair. Without hope, you can go jump into a lagoon. Without hope, you can kill yourself. Hope sustains you. The hope that at some point, one day, one day, there will be a change. You see, that's not faith. One day, one day, there will be a change. That's hope. That's a desire and an expectation in a sense. But... Faith now comes in and says there has, a, with, with an event, there's always an event. Faith doesn't, hope doesn't just translate to faith, there's usually an event. Hands were laid on me, I prayed, I asked God, I, I, there's always an event. I, I said, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea. So the moment I said that, that was my event. So from hope that the mountain will move, I believe that the mountain has moved. Said, but the mountain is still there. Jesus taught us about that. Remember when he cursed the fig tree? 
in this Mark chapter 11, the, 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 very, the very event he used to teach them about faith, Mark 11, he cursed, he saw a fig tree that was, with, that, that was without fruits. And he, he went there and tried to get some, some fig from the tree, and the, there was no figs. And Jesus said, no man will eat fruit of you hereafter forever. And he walked away. And of course, the disciples heard him, but the tree did not wither immediately. But Jesus was not saying to himself, oh, one day, one day, this tree will wither. No. As far as Jesus was concerned, the tree had withered. And you know that was his mindset, because he never went back to check the tree. He never went back to see if it has withered. It was the disciples that went there, you know, the next day, 24 hours later, to check. And they said, wow, the fig tree that you cursed had withered. The, tree, the, the, the fig tree you, you cursed has withered. They went to check. Jesus didn't bother checking. He was dumb. <laughs> All right. Another thing faith is not. Faith is not presumption. Faith is not presumption. In other words, faith is not an assumption it is based on a promise. Let me say what it means to presume. Most of you know what it means to presume, right? If you said now, after this service, Pastor Noel is going to send me a car from wherever he is because I attended this service. I graced them with my presence. So he's going to give me a car. First thing anybody will ask you is, why do you think so? Why are you so convinced? And you say, uh, I don't know. I just feel that way. And the person will look at you and say, you're presuming. You're presuming he will give you a car. You're presuming. You see, a person can become convinced about something that was not Wrongly so. And oftentimes because of either pride or some wrong assumptions of something that was not promised. If I didn't promise you a car, you are presuming. There's only two things. If I didn't promise you that when you come to church, I'll give you a car, then you are presuming. So the presumption is trying to get convinced about something that you don't have a promise for. You are presuming. Faith is not presumption. If you say, oh, Father, you know, when I pray right now and ask for Nkechi, after there's the pre-event and post-event. The event is that I ask for Nkechi. Now, in the name of Jesus, when I pray and ask for Nkechi, post-event, Nkechi is mine. But no matter what, no matter what, Nkechi is mine. You are presuming. Why? There's no promise. No, no scripture promises you in kitchen. There's a scripture promising you a good marriage. There's a scripture promising you a good wife. Not even a good marriage, really. But a good wife is promised you. You need to walk out a good marriage. But a good wife is promised you. And you can believe for that. But you can't believe on kitchen. Nobody promised you in kitchen. And in kitchen, nobody promised you to do. Are you getting this? Nobody promised you these things or these people. So you can't pray that way. You can't have faith for that. What you have, if you are very convinced, you, you just have presumption. You just presume. And, and even when the things are promised, but you don't know that it is a promise, you don't know it inside of you that it's your promise, it's still presumption. If I announced and said, anyone that comes to church in Kampala, our, service, our church in Kampala, I will give you a car each. If I made that announcement and you did not hear it, you didn't know I said that, and you showed up there that day, and you said, I want a car. Pastor Noel, I came to your church, you should give me a car. You're still presuming. Even though I did make the promise, since you didn't hear it, you are there is no basis for that belief. You are presuming. 
So presumption also includes someone who says, I am healed, but has never taken the time to go into the word of God and known for himself that he is healed. Do you have that promise for yourself? Have you meditated on it? Have you, have you made it your own promise? Or is this something your pastor says? When I first began this journey of faith, 1994, I came back home from school, 1994. And, and I announced, because my pastor used to preach then and announce, you cannot be sick. You can't die on the, on the road like a chicken. You, you, you are the right churches of God in Christ Jesus. You cannot be sick. You can, so I used to, so I came back to the church I used to attend in the city. This was on campus. Now in the city, I used to attend a particular church before I went to campus. So I came back there and I was so eager to let them know I found this new thing. I found this stuff that you can't be sick. And I started announcing to everybody, you cannot be sick. You, you know, I cannot be sick. And within a space of two weeks, I got so sick, I, I had typhoid. Within a space of a week or so of saying it, you know, I got typhoid. And, and, and I, you know, I just started feeling feverish and all the symptoms began to show up. And I was, I kept telling them, listen, it doesn't matter. I cannot be sick. Huh? I cannot be sick. Huh? But inside of me, I was like, oh God, please don't embarrass me. This thing that uh, my pastor used to say, you know, let it be real for me. Let it, see, that, see, that, see, there was no conviction. Deep inside of me, I knew that I was struggling. I knew I was worried. I knew I was hoping I don't get embarrassed. That can't be faith. It's like being afraid that if they, if they check my body and check my chromosomes, they will find out I'm a woman. You're not convinced. And of course, the sickness increased. I, I became sick the more. And I had to be rushed to the hospital. And it was a terrible experience. You know, as they were taking me to the hospital, you know, guys who were looking for how to make, make jest of me, they found an opportunity. Oh boy, it was shameful. Sometimes you go through some stuff and wondering why God would allow it. You know, looking back now, I'm glad about that because I, I had to leave the periphery. I had to dig into the world by myself. So all the way to the hospital, I was like, God, why would you allow this to happen? Because they were making, they took, they didn't even take me in a car. They took me on a bike. So the 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 guy, the, the, one, the one guy was behind me. You know, there were like four people, three people on the bike. So the bike man, the guy behind me, and another person was on another bike, and they were rushing me to the hospital. And they were holding me like that was like this, you know. And they were holding me, and they were just making, they were like, "Hey, you cannot be sick. Oh, this is not even sickness at all. Don't, don't please, please, this is not sickness. He's just doing his head like this." I was even too weak to attempt to say anything. They got me to the hospital and the doctor said, what is it? He said, no, he's not sick. He's not sick. He's not sick at all. He cannot be sick. And when the doctor figured out what was happening, he said, oh, he can't be sick. He went to get an injection. He said, no, he's not sickness. You can't be sick. <laughs> Give me an injection. I'm like, ah, so why are you shouting? In fact, this is not even an injection. I'm not injecting you. This is not happening. <laughs> Boy, I've never been that embarrassed in my life. And I can, you know, looking back now, I can imagine God going in heaven just smiling. Sometimes you think you are going through the worst of times. Let me encourage somebody here. You think you are going through the worst of times and God is in heaven smiling because he can see your future. Ah, He can see your future. God saw that in a few, matter of a few months, I was going to begin a journey of divine health that has lasted 28 years from 1995 till today based on that same revelation. But I didn't have it for myself. It was presumption. It was pure presumption. Is it true that by the stripes of Jesus I am healed? Yes. But did I know it? No. I didn't know it for myself. Just something my pastor used to say. <laughs> have faith not in your pastor. Have faith in God. Real faith is always in God, not in your pastor. You have to go to that word yourself. You have to open this word. That's why the Bible says, my son, give ear, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my saints. So it begins with you hearing it. Hear your pastor saying it. Hear the preacher saying it. Hear it on YouTube. It begins with you hearing it. But then he says, do not let them depart from your eyes. So that thing you've heard me say, 
as your pastor. Now go yourself and put it in your eyes. Go yourself and study it. Go yourself, open the Bible. Open it and read it. And read it. Your eyes. Your own eyes. <laughs> you need to hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it. You need to read it and read it and read it and read it and read it again and read it again until it becomes you become full of it. So when I got back home, I was so embarrassed. I didn't talk to God for a few days. We were quarreling. <laughs> we were quarreling. I said, God, now I'm not talking to you. You embarrassed me. Well, eventually, eventually I, you know, had to talk to him. That's the thing about God. When you're done with your tantrum, <laughs> you still come back home. I said, okay, God, what happened? And God said, it was not your reality. You didn't believe it. There's no two way about it, you know. Just those, when the disciples could not cast out that devil in the Bible, they came to Jesus and said, "Why could we not cast it out?" The, the boy with epilepsy. Jesus said, "Because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief." They were expecting some some deep explanation that would make them feel good that okay, maybe it's just because I'm in primary one, maybe it's a primary three level thing. No, he said, "No, because of your unbelief. You just don't believe. There's no there are no two explanations. It's your unbelief." So God told me, said, you are not in faith. What do you mean I'm not in faith? You didn't, you, not, you, you didn't have conviction. Why didn't you have conviction? Because you presumed. It was not, you didn't have a promise. Okay, which scripture promises you divine health? I couldn't point to any scripture. Just something my pastor used to say. It was a, a new thing for me. My pastor said I can't be sick. No, not, not faith in my pastor. It's faith in God's word. Faith in God. So I have to hear what God is saying. Not what my pastor said. I have to take what my pastor, my pastor can tell me that God said something. But I, because I'm the son of God myself, I go to the word of God and let God say it to me from his word. Faith in God. Jesus said in Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. That's how you avoid presumption. I came back home and I started meditating and studying the scriptures for myself. Now I, now I have heard. You know what I'm doing now? I'm now studying. I'm not letting it depart from my eyes. I came across Matthew 8, 17. I've never forgotten it. Matthew 8, 17. He says, he himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. He took it. And somehow, that rose inside of me. And I started thinking about that. He took it. He took my, I, I made it personal. He took my infirmities and carried my diseases. That means any disease in this world, even there are diseases in this world, they are not mine. Somebody ate mine. Somebody consumed mine. So every disease that touches this body is an illegality. That was where that started. So every germ that touches my body has to die instantly. Every bacteria, every fungi that touches my body has to die instantly because I am not with sickness. Sickness has my own has been consumed. If somebody served us different plates of food and labeled names on it and then someone came and ate mine, I say, who ate my food? There, there's, there are others there, but they are not mine. I will have to steal to take from someone else. But someone ate mine. Who ate mine? The same way mine, my sickness, my diseases have been consumed. Yours have been consumed. So every other one in your body is an illegality and you can refuse to have it. That was the revelation that transformed my life. And I began to walk in divine health. Hallelujah. Faith is not presumption. Lastly, okay, let me show you that from the word of God. Let me show you that from the scriptures. In fact, let, let's go to the next one and then we look at scriptures. Faith is not, because of time, faith is not foolishness. Faith is not foolishness. So faith is not hope. It's going to happen. It's going one day, one day. It's going to happen. One day, one day, go better. One day, one day, we will prosper. That's not faith. One day, one day, my money will increase. That's not faith. That's hope. Faith is not presumption. You have to have the word. In fact, everybody say they say no word, no faith. So, you know what? I wanted to take you to the scriptures and change my mind. I'm changing my mind again. And I'm going to show you. But we may not come back to it. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans 10, 17. We're going to come back to this scripture several times 
uh, next week when we finalize on this faith teaching. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. No word, no faith. No word, no faith. Anything outside of the word of God that you heard and saw for yourself, you are presuming. Even if it is true that God said so, you need to hear it for yourself. Or you are presuming. So lastly, faith is not foolishness. Let me, let me take that off from scripture. See, people, when they hear about faith, they start doing some stuff. They start saying some things like, you know what, I'm going to quit my job and, and live by faith. I'm going to quit my job and start using my faith for money. That's foolishness. Is your job against money? Is your job against money? If you want to use your faith for money and a job is providing money, why is that anti each other? Oh, I'm believing, I believe God that I'm healed, so I'm not going to take any drug. That's foolishness. Is the drug against faith? When Jesus came to pray for the womb, the girl who eventually died before he got there, the lady he said, Talita Kumi, the daughter of Jairus. When Jesus was coming to pray for her, did he ask them, has she been taking drugs already before now? Because if she has been taking drugs, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. My faith and drugs can't work together. Of course, they've been treating her. Do you think they just allowed her to get to the point of death without any form of medication? They've tried everything they could. What about the woman with the issue of blood that actually said, the Bible said, that she has gone through many doctors and they couldn't help her? Did the power of God say, oh, because she has touched medicine, we cannot help her? I'm sorry, power of God. And medicine, they don't collide. It's foolishness to say because of faith, you won't do some things in the natural that you should do. You won't work. You won't read your books because you believe you will prosper. You, you will prosper in your academics. So you, and you're not going to read your books. You're not going to be diligent. That's not faith. That's foolishness. Faith is not foolishness. Let me show you in First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 3. First Timothy. Is somebody learning from this? First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. First Timothy 5 verse 23. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for Paul was telling Timothy. Timothy, you've been having a lot of stomach upset and falling ill and unable to do your job because of that, the illness that comes from your stomach, whatever. And he said, so don't just drink water alone. Take a little bit of wine. And people have argued that wine is not alcoholic. There's no proof of that. No, we need to stay with the word and not traditions. Either way. All right? There's no proof that that, that wine there is not alcoholic. And then some people have taken that to say, well, it means that alcohol has been recommended by the scriptures. No, that, that also is not true. In fact, if anything, this statement proves that this, this uh, 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 men of God in, this, in the scriptures here were not for drinking, were not for alcohol. This statement proves that Paul had to convince Timothy to take some wine because of an issue. So I can imagine the scenario of, 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 of a, a, a Timothy being sick and it was discovered that some wine could help him in that particular sickness. That is not the same as going to go and drink wine. No. He, he, was, he was having an issue and somehow there was the assumption or a testimony or recommendation of a physician or someone that Paul could trust that said he needs to take a little wine. And Paul said to him, take a little wine. And the way that the father Paul had to write to him indicates that Timothy was resisting having to drink wine even though it could help him. So when they are thinking, oh, the Bible says we can drink wine. Well, are you sick? Is there a recommendation? It's the same as someone saying, 
because he found out that there is some coke, coke, right? Coke, cocaine, cocaine. In a particular drug, some drugs are made with some, some cocaine. And some drugs that have cocaine in them. It's like somebody saying, I am anti-cocaine. And I am. I am anti-cocaine. I've never taken it. I pray my children never take it. I pray my children's children never take it. And if you, are, if you have good plans for your family, you hope they never get into cocaine, never get into heroin and all of those drug, uh, 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 all of those hard drugs. But then there is an element of cocaine in certain drugs. It's the same as saying, well, I am anti-cocaine and therefore I'm not going to take this drug. And then they give you a drug and then you put it, you say, no, it has cocaine, I'm not going to take it. And someone can tell you, no, 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 go ahead and take it. It's not, it's not against faith. It's, you're not doing anything wrong. Go ahead and take it. That's different from you living there and saying, well, maybe if, since there is some cocaine allowed, then I can go ahead and be taking cocaine. And abusing the drug. I mean, I could go on and on. So, but why I read that scripture to you is that Paul told Timothy to take something that could help his recovery even though he was believing God for his recovery. So it is okay to, to take something that will help you. You're, you're, and even oftentimes necessary to take something that will help. So if, don't, don't throw away your glasses because you believe that you are healed. Uh, 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 and your, your, eyes, your, eyes are, say, eyes, your eyes are clear. Don't, don't throw away your medicine because you believe you are healed. No. Continue to take your drugs. But with a full conviction inside of you that you have the title deed. Someone says, how, how is that possible? Let's, let's take title deed. If I give you a title deed to a piece of land, sign it over to you. Contract signed, still stamped. Here it is. It's yours. It doesn't mean that you can start building right at that moment. Right where we are standing. That may not be your land. To build, you have to go locate that land. You have to get some permits. You have to get so some there's a process that might be involved leading to a building now standing there in the, on that land. But between that that my giving you the title deed and that building standing there, the land is yours. So you are just going through process, but the land is yours. The healing is yours. You don't go back begging for the healing. You can't come to me and beg for the land again because you don't have a building, a place to stay. Pastor, I don't have a place to stay. Please give me that land. I'll give me that. I gave you the land. Now, there may be a process leading to your establishing a home or a house on that land, but even while that process is going on, you have the land. The same way you are healed. And you may need to sleep somewhere else, just like the land, for a while before you step into that house being built over there. It doesn't mean that that's not your house. It doesn't mean that that's not your land. And so even if you are going through stuff, still feeling symptoms in your body, you keep thanking God that you have the title deed for your health and your healing. And I prophesy over everyone under the sound of my voice. Every sickness, every disease, every infirmity in your body. Right now, receive your healing in Jesus' name. Now, take that title deed. Start praising God for it. Start thanking God. Wake up every morning and consider not. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, boy. Next week, when we start talking about how to use your faith. Don't miss it for anything. You see, when you wake up tomorrow morning, Bible says, Abraham considered not his body, now, now, now dead, being a hundred years old. He considered it not. God gave him a promise. He believed that promise. But he, he stayed holding on to that promise. And it, was, it, was, it became his reality 25 years down the road. But he had a promise. And he held on to the promise. And what was he doing in the meantime? Considered not his body. Now there. So you consider not certain things. The things that negate your faith. Consider them not. And then what, what should he be considering? Consider Jesus. Consider the sacrifice. Bible says, consider Jesus. He Hebrews chapter 12. Consider Jesus. Co Abraham considered not his body. Then the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 12, consider Jesus. Set your mind on Jesus. 
Verse 3, Hebrews 12, verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Consider Jesus. Consider him. Hallelujah. Who endured sickness, disease, poverty, lack. Who took your infirmities and carried your diseases. By whose stripes you are healed. Consider that. Set that on your mind. Consider not your body. Consider him. Forget not his benefits, Bible says. And you forget it not by considering, by putting it on your mind. Remembering. Remembering. He took my infirmities. He carried my diseases. So in the name of Jesus, sickness, you can't stay in this body. Thank you, Father, because I am healed. Don't miss next week as we talk about how to actually now use your faith. Now you know what faith is. You know what faith is not. Join me next week as we learn how to use faith. How to get it and how to use it. Those two things next week. Glory to God. Father, thank you for your word today. We ask that you help us live out what we're learning. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. All right, now go ahead. Uh, uh, um, your leaders are going to take over from here. And pastors, I hand over to you. You do as the Spirit of God leads you and go on with your service. Thank you for hearing this. And um, I, I pray that you we will share great testimonies about amazing things. And, and let me say this quickly, very quickly. Um, God spoke to me and said, um, let's, we need to start using our faith for, for its ultimate goal. There's faith as a shield. We'll talk about this in detail next week. But there's faith to do the impossible things. Bible says, taking up the shield of faith. So that's one use of faith. But Bible also says, for him that believeth, to him that believeth, all things are possible. So there is the shield of faith where you are blocking what the devil is throwing at you. Defensive use of faith. But there is an offensive use of faith. And that is when you begin to go for things that don't make sense to the human mind. God told me it's time for us to start doing that. Let's talk again next week.